On November 27, 2021, George Cambosos faced off against the undisputed unified WBA, IBF, WBO, and the ring lightweight champion Teofimo Lopez. Being that George Cambosos is of Hellenic descent, born and raised in Australia, I figured what better time to make a boxing breakdown than for a fellow Greek countryman who, against all odds, reached the peak of his division through sheer skill, heart, and determination. Here, I'll put forth an analysis of the subtle strategic and tactical elements I was able to decipher through repeated views of the fight. The amount of footage I'll be able to display is very limited, so please bear with me through any stale or repetitive editing. Of course, none of my videos are monetized, so hopefully it won't be too much of an issue. I rely solely on the potential support from my Patreon page, so if you'd like to give that a look, it'd be very much appreciated. That being said, let's get straight to it. Lopez's game plan was pretty straightforward. Rush in and go for the knockout. No holds barred, full rushdown. This of course had to change in later rounds as he saw that his overly aggressive approach was not progressing very well. He later resorted to his usual style of staying just in range of his jab and using advancing footwork to overwhelm his opponent in bursts. He particularly excels at varying the timing of his approach, either by fainting or skipping beats. In doing so, his strikes become unpredictable, and because of his size and power, one strike could be enough to end the fight. Lopez also doesn't mind trading punches with his opponents due to the superiority of his stature, particularly at 135 pounds. As much as I don't like categorizing boxers into the four standard archetypal styles, Lopez fits the mold of a boxer puncher almost perfectly. Cambosis had a more robust strategic approach to the fight that was specifically tailored to counteract Lopez's usual game plan. In the beginning, Cambosis would use counter punches to intercept Lopez's advances, but throughout the fight he would stay just out of range of Lopez's jabs, but lean his head forward to give Lopez the illusion that he was at the range that Lopez specifically wanted him to be. He could then pull away from Lopez's jab and still have enough time to react to Lopez's bursts and combinations. The way he would react to these bursts was also varied. He would either pull back, allow Lopez to whiff and then strike him on the recovery, or he would lean in towards Lopez to diminish the effectiveness of his punches and throw a combination of his own. Because Lopez's game plan was so straightforward and because Lopez didn't adapt much to Cambosos in the fight, Cambosos had no need to change his strategic approach except maybe for the 10th round but I'll get back to that later. Now that we have an idea of the game plan of each fighter, let's look at the various tactics they employed during the fight. To deal with Lopez's overaggression, Cambosos uses what is known as a check hook. The strike allowed him to gain some distance by stepping backwards and also deal damage to Lopez by throwing a hook using the momentum of his body turning. Because the check hook is used while Lopez is striking, he can't actively block the punch, which makes this weapon very effective to an opponent that's recklessly trying to advance. Cambosu sticks his chin out, baiting Lopez to throw a strike. He waits for the lead jab or hook to whiff, then punishes with his own lead hand, and his strikes are incredibly fast. Many argue that Lopez realized he was in trouble when he first got knocked down, but I disagree. In my opinion, he realized he was in trouble in minute 144 of the first round, where he started to pick up on Cambosis' tactic. You can see Lopez is clearly frustrated as he sees Cambosis toying with him, and when Cambosis sees that Lopez is thinking about it too much, he strikes first. Lopez is now playing Cambosis' game, and he's unsure how to counter it. Now this tactic is used by both fighters, but more so by Lopez, who, in all fairness, does execute it better than Cambosos. The timing of Cambosos' bursts are a bit obvious, which allows Lopez to many times counter. Lopez, on the other hand, varies his timing significantly, which makes it really difficult to time his punches, and being unable to time an opponent's punches translates to uncertainty in when to move, when to strike, or when to use footwork. For example, there are many times throughout the fight that Cambosos gets caught when the referee breaks the two. This is perhaps because he expects Lopez to stagger or wait before punching, and Lopez immediately comes out swinging. The downside to these bursts is that if one gets carried away, they become predictable. In the first round, Lopez believed there was blood in the water after Cambosos misjudged the distance between them and was hit with some right hand strikes. Lopez then became overly eager to hit Cambosos with a strong enough punch that would knock him out. 
However, this overconfidence led Lopez to fight in a very predictable rhythm, which Cambosis quickly picked up on. He then knew when the next punch would come, and this is when he catches Lopez with a big counter overhand right, knocking him down. The Philly Shell or Shoulder Roll is a stance that allows boxers to roll and deflect punches, opening their opponent for counter strikes like a rear hand cross, hook, or uppercut. Cambosis in the second round shows that he has a pretty good shoulder roll in his defensive arsenal. Still, in later rounds, Lopez was able to exploit the holes in his stance by throwing overarching right hand strikes that reached above the shoulder of Cambosis. This particularly happened in the ninth round and also led to Cambosis being knocked down in the tenth. In the 10th round, it appears that Camposis was looking for that overhand strike to follow Lopez's jab, but instead, Lopez shot the strike low, catching Camposis behind the ear while he was ducking. Now, Camposis does use the shoulder roll successfully in the fight, like in round 4, and arguably much better than Lopez. We also see Camposis employ a particular tactic to combat Lopez's shoulder roll in later rounds, and I'll get to that soon. But before moving on, forgive me for a slight tangent I will go on about the shoulder roll, and particularly about deflecting strikes, as it ties into ancient Greek warfare. The reason why ancient Hellenic shields were both round and curved instead of flat like wooden viking shields is because ancient Greek warriors preferred incoming strikes to be deflected rather than absorbed. The deflection could cause an opponent to lose balance or open themselves up to a counterattack. The Spartan shield in particular had curvature for two reasons. One being of course deflecting strikes, the second being so that it can contour to the back of the leading Spartan warrior in front of them. This made it easier to hold the line in battle in the most effective way possible, without the risk of injury. Feints are where Lobas excels most. He uses both subtle and not so subtle feints to keep Cambosis guessing and catch him off guard, which he does do on several occasions. What makes his feints effective is the fact that he possesses knockout power in this division. This means that every motion he goes through must be taken seriously, which allows him to effectively use this tactic throughout the match. The fencing, saber-like motions of the lead hand require hand speed, power, and precision, all of which are qualities that Cambosus appears to possess. It is an attack, or sequence of attacks, thrown with the lead hand that are meant to track the opponent through any head movements or dodge attempts. Because of the speed of these strikes, they are difficult to react to, yet can still cause serious damage. We see Cambosis mainly utilize stiff jabs, directs, and hooks, though uppercuts are also possible. At many points in the fight, Cambosis would show suggestive motions to get in Lopez's head. For example, he'll show the right hand, then strike with the left. He'll stick his shoulder out and invite Lopez to attack while he readies a counter. He'll raise his hand near to his face to suggest that he'll block, then shoot a jab. However, this tactic is best done in motion, as otherwise the opponent can take advantage. For example, in the third round, Cambosis was trying to show his right hand so he could advance with a jab, but Lopez saw this as an opportunity to trade and chased it with a cross. Remember, Lopez wants to trade, so indicating an attack while standing still was not a good use of the tactic. To combat Lopez's shoulder roll, Cambosis executes a unique hand trap. In the fifth round, Cambosis hooks and traps Lopez's rear hand, making him turn into the incoming overhand right. You'd think he would trap the lead hand, which is in the path of Cambosis' overhand right, but instead he traps the rear hand. Why? 1. To size him up so he can calculate the angle of attack. 2. Scare Lopez into thinking a left hook is coming so he can tighten his guard. 3. Cause Lopez to turn into the hooking right. And 4. And most importantly, neutralize a hand that can counterattack from the Philly shell, the right. Cambosis later used the same identical tactic successfully in the 6th round. At this point, he's used the hand trap into the rear hand overhead twice, so Cambosis figures Lopez might try to duck the overhand. Sure enough, Lopez ducks, and Cambosis was ready. Instead of an overhand, he goes for an uppercut, which lands on Lopez cleanly. This just goes to show how Cambosis was really one step ahead. Note that in the same round, Cambosis uses the threat of this tactic to land against Lopez, catching Lopez completely off guard. Even Lopez seems to like the tactic and actually used it himself later in the fight. I can't stress enough how excellent Cambosis' shuffle is in the close range. 
This is something that can be incredibly intimidating to face, as it shows that your opponent is fighting in their own rhythm and comfort zone, and you've done nothing to force them out of it. Cambosis' ability to go in and out of the pocket is, in my opinion, his strongest asset. He will enter, strike, and return back to the mid-range in the blink of an eye. In fact, he will even use the strikes themselves to help him transition. In round 7, for example, after hitting his combination, he doesn't just retreat. He'll throw a stiff jab or a cross to either push his opponent outwards or push himself back to the mid-range. The biggest highlight of this shuffle, however, is in the 11th round. At the beginning of the round, Cambosis uses his lead hand to control space, but he gets hit with some heavy shots due to his hands being low. To Cambosis' credit, these strikes didn't influence him in the slightest. Instead, he begins to shuffle right in front of Lopez, showing that he's still in his rhythm and in his comfort zone. He pursues with lead hand strikes, then hits Lopez with the 1-2 that opened his eye. After this, Lopez's demeanor completely changed. He was no longer the relaxed fighter that we're used to seeing. That shuffle completely threw him for a loop, and the right hand that Cambosis landed, which cut his eye, just sealed the deal. Cambosis was incredibly focused and landing strikes with laser-like precision. Lopez saw that even though he landed some significant strikes, Cambosis showed no weakness. Again, I'll go on the tangent, because I can't help but be reminded of the Spartan warriors that Cambosis has tattooed on his back. In particular, the use of the color red of their capes. The reason they were colored red was so that if a Spartan bleeded, the blood wouldn't show. In other words, even when they were hurt, their opponent couldn't see the damage the Spartan had endured. And when the Spartan would fight on unfazed, it would further demoralize the foes he faced. Now for some closing thoughts on the fight. Starting off with Lopez, he was simply a two-dimensional fighter. He would either strike or skip a beat, faint, and then strike. Lopez is powerful, has a strong chin, and is not afraid to trade punches. But when he faced a defensive fighter that also didn't mind going to war, he got outboxed. The main issue here is that Lopez didn't have a game plan for this fight, to the point where he began mirroring Cambosis' movements and tactics. Of course, this is an error in the coaching and preparation, so it would be dishonest of me to judge him based on this performance. If he had prepared to face Cambosis' defensive maneuverability, then we might have seen a bit more depth in his fighting. When things didn't go as planned, Lopez relied solely on his fundamentals, which simply weren't enough. Perhaps Lopez's downfall in this fight was how emotional he was throughout. From the very first round, you can see his anger and frustration. He actually fought best when he was relaxed and in control, which only lasted for a couple of rounds where he was ahead. When things got tough, he got demoralized and it showed heavily in the 11th and 12th. Now as for the excuses that were made for Lopez after the fight, all I can say is he didn't look like he was getting tired, his stamina was good, there was a lot of strength in his punches, so I don't see how any of this affected him. It is clear that Lopez had his game plan completely countered, and thus he got outboxed. There isn't much more that strength and conditioning would have done in this case. Now to Cambosis. Cambosis clearly showed that he is not a single-faceted fighter. He displayed intelligence, a good sense of rhythm and timing, and the ability to remain emotionally unfazed throughout the fight. The man got knocked down, hit by significant strikes, and still carried on like nothing happened. As a fellow Greek, I was proud to see Cambosis live up to the courage and determination of the Spartan warriors he wears on his back as a symbol of his heritage. Of course, in my humble opinion and with all due respect, I do believe he still has room for improvement. Here are some examples of what I think would elevate Cambosis' game. First, adding a lead hand uppercut to his arsenal. This would complement his saber-like jab and hook that he's already mastering. Secondly, to better capitalize off the pull counter. Instead of waiting for his opponent to recover, he can strike simultaneously with the pull, something that Mayweather did masterfully. Third his circular footwork. In this fight, he stayed up close with Lopez and either absorbed his strikes by leaning in the pocket or just trading punches. The fact of the matter here is that he really didn't need to do this. I don't know if it's the warrior's pride or the heat of the moment, but trading with an opponent that is visibly larger is risky and surely not good for his health during and even more so after the fight. Cambosis clearly outsmarted Lopez, so there was really no need to play into his game. 
Cambosis perhaps should have instead evaded his opponent's bursts through footwork. When Lopez is stuttering or skipping beats, he could have disengaged from the mix-up and circle the ring to frustrate Lopez and further dictate the pace. This tactic has long been used in modern boxing by giants like Jean Tunney, particularly when he faced Jack Dempsey in the long count, Muhammad Ali, and Floyd Mayweather Jr. Of course, in this particular case, it's easier said than done, as Lopez does have incredibly fast advancing footwork, but I do believe that Camposis could still have pulled it off. He does use this tactic in the 4th and 6th round to a limited extent. Since he has the speed and stamina to pull it off, he may just need to hone the technique or incorporate it more into his arsenal. Now when it comes to trading punches, another good thing about Cambos is that he has an instinct to strike back after being hit. This will cause his opponent to think twice about throwing more punches. However, this instinct can be exploited and turned against him if he's not careful. Still, for a defensive boxer, the fact that he can punch while being hit and the fact that he can throw Pacquiao style combinations means he has potential to dominate his division. Finally, the last thing I believe can really help Cambosis moving forward is having the ability to change his game plan on the fly. In the 10th round, after he gets knocked down because of that disorienting strike that hit him behind the ear, Cambosis still goes back to the same mid-range distance. Though his motor skills were not fully operational, his legs were somewhat wobbly and he was very close to being knocked down for a second time. It's in times like these where switching up the strategy to give yourself some time to recover can help immensely. Being able to change game plans depending on the situation can elevate Cambosis to a whole nother level. Once again, these suggestions or criticisms are just my way of seeing things, which could be totally different if I had more context of the fight, like seeing it in person, hearing what his coach was advising, or speaking to Cambosis to hear what was actually going through his mind during the situations. Still. As I mentioned, I believe Cambosis is not a one-trick pony, nor was his win of Luke. Win or lose going forward, he is a great fighter that has a lot of heart and the potential to become an all-time great. Thank you very much for watching, and once again if you'd like to help the channel and allow me to make these videos more often, please check out my Patreon page below. Cheers, and I'll catch you in the next video.